This episode is brought to you by Brilliant. Long before we knew what the stars above truly were, we contemplated them as the home to immensely powerful beings. That may turn out to still be the case. Thirty-five years ago, the Star Trek franchise opened a new chapter with the premiere of Star Trek The Next Generation and the episode Encounter at Farpoint. And the studio wanted a two-hour first episode so they padded the script with things like a really long docking sequence and an additional encounter with a strange and powerful alien known only as Q, played by John Delancey. This addition to fill out the runtime resulted in Q becoming a recurring character throughout Next Generation, and appearing in Deep Space Nine and Voyager and will be in Picard Season 2, which will have premiered by the time this episode comes out. Q is probably the most famous godlike alien we see in science fiction, though hardly the only one, Stargate is full of them as is the MCU, we even see more in Star Trek, and Q definitely has a flavor of the capricious, the arrogant, and the cruel or we so often see with deities out of Greek and Roman mythology. Again though, he is not the only godlike alien we meet, indeed in the original Star Trek the crew outright meets the Greek god Apollo and fights him. As is often the case in sci-fi, his power comes from something technological. He is really just impersonating a deity, or was an alien that folks came to see as one. However, that's not the case with Q, and we see a mix of such things in other franchises, probably most notably in recent years with the Marvel MCU, where we get Thor and Odin and Loki and whatever they're planning to do with the Eternals and Celestials in upcoming films. So our topic today is to discuss what godlike aliens might actually be like if we end up encountering them in our real universe or our simulated or created universe perhaps, and we'll be drawing a lot of science fiction for conceptual reference points and comparisons. Now in fiction they can come in a lot of flavors, indeed even the same character can depending on portrayal. Q for instance can seem diabolic, petty, mischievous, or even the stern teacher varying by the case. One moment he's a petulant child who is easily wound up or tricked, Another episode he's almost pleading with the crew, and audience, to take the hard high road to greater exploration and enlightenment, and in this regard he very much matches what we often see in other fictional and mythological divine cases, a mixed and varying perspective on the motives and actions of godlike individuals, as well as groups of them. As is often the case in our Alien Civilization series, we will draw on these examples to help examine the topic. But here we need to start by acknowledging that the necessity for a good story tends to limit the accuracy of such characters. For instance, it is a very boring story if you encounter a hyper-advanced and intelligent species who really are very kind and enlightened, and also willing to actively help you. Folks are living and dying and often fighting some dread evil that these aliens could help out against, but they won't. When asked, the aliens will usually give a fairly stock response about us not being ready or it being immoral to force their will on others, even to prevent genocide and how we just don't understand. Now philosophically this is legitimate enough, it's essentially the age-old problem of evil, popularized by David Hume and attributed Epicurus to sometime in the 3rd or 4th century BC, but probably a lot older. You've probably heard it phrased as, why does an all-powerful and all-good god allow evil or bad things to happen? But it's probably better phrased today as, if something is really evil, it cannot be necessary, and if it is really necessary, it cannot be evil. For the moment what matters though is that most writers aren't using this philosophical debate as their reason for standoffish super-aliens, but rather because the story gets boring real quick if they get involved. It is sort of like if in the Star Wars prequel trilogies, the 20,000 Jedi Knights said to exist actually sent a few dozen Jedi Knights to deal with the crisis on Naboo, rather than just one Jedi and a Padawan. They could also have sent a dozen Jedi Knights to arrest the Chancellor, or sent more than a handful of Jedi in a ton of other situations. That's the first rule of warfare after all, there is no such thing as overkill. From a fictional perspective though, the story would get pretty boring. 
Unfortunately, its repetition in the ongoing plot makes people unwilling to accept it as a constant and repetitive coincidence. Now that sort of situation, also popular in sci-fi, is a reminder of the first rule of warfare, always keep some reserves for dealing with unexpected emergencies, but both notions are hard to handle properly in writing stories because invincible, active, and reliable allies, or proper measured responses with available resources, rarely make for good films and TV. They do often make for better books. And it's pretty common for a TV adaptation of a book character not only to be played by a younger actor in the show than the character is in the books, and for them to seem to act a lot younger too. The Jim Holden of the TV show, The Expanse, seems a lot younger and more reckless than his book version for instance, who generally makes decisions based on a calm head and reasoned argument shared with the reader, not brash and often crazy sounding ones. The same is true for Frodo from Tolkien's classic, Lord of the Rings. Frodo is 51 years old when he flees the Shire with the Ring, 17 years after he got it, and he takes his sweet time in an attempt to quietly disappear. He's not young or immature and he's viewed as the wiser older brother or boss by his fellow hobbits, and he often comes off this way in the novels. Of course those novels also show us a lot of mysterious behavior by divine agents that result in stuff like the eagles showing up when it's convenient. This is exactly what they are doing, they are implied to be divine agencies, and something similar applies to Gandalf, who is not human, and those various elves like Lorfindel, who also fought a Balrog and was resurrected like Gandalf. But these folks are necessarily sidelined in a lot of stories because they are too powerful. This is a common tool in fiction. In the story, the reasoning would tend to be that some power above wants them all minimally in play just to intercede to keep the test or game fair and let the normal people decide their own fate. Now alien civilizations make an interesting addition to this mix for a couple of reasons. First, we know what technology can do to make one group overwhelmingly invincible to another both our civilization versus more technologically primitive ones, and a human group compared to animal cousins. So folks find it easy enough to believe that if there are aliens out there, some of them have millennia of technological advantage over us, see our episode on clock tech for some examples of that. For show regulars this is even worse, because while fiction sometimes gestures in the direction of advanced evolution or ascendancy to a higher state of being, we know what some of the technological implications of transhumanism and posthumans are. It gives you folks who are still finite and mortal, not the all-powerful and infinite god with a capital G, but they're not impersonating gods, lower case, any more than Superman, Thor, or Hercules war, indeed a lot less so as we'll get to in a moment. The second reason why Alien Civilizations makes an interesting addition is because of the Fermi Paradox, the apparent absence of aliens in our universe, at least in the active and open role. Many of us, myself included, tend to assume intelligent aliens are just ultra-rare, and the laws of physics and causality so ultra-rigid that we simply have not encountered any yet. For others, these aliens either act semi-convertly here on Earth, based on all the sightings, and indeed often mythological figures will be suggested to be examples of early sightings and alien visitation, or they hide from us and don't involve themselves for some reason. Needless to say, both those cases, intentionally unseen by us, and here but quietly involved, fit the mysterious advanced godlike alien trope pretty well, as does the slightly snobby version who doesn't deign to contact us. And we see this a lot with the space elves tropes, and also with the good-hearted wanderer or misanthrope style character we often see in folks like Gandalf, though I often feel the tendency to be touchy and antisocial is a narrative excuse for why they don't answer questions and people don't press them, and thus spoil the story or mystery or expose a plot hole. They often seem like Diogenes the Cynic, a smart man who eschews all comforts and trappings of wealth and power, and often some parallel quest to his own of seeking to find an honest man. Personally, I've never liked that flavor of character, but then I never really agreed with or liked Diogenes, who I generally think had such problems finding an honest or admirable person because he was neither and thus wouldn't recognize either. 
Incidentally, Gandalf is a Maiar in Tolkien mythology, not human, as are Sauron and Sauron, and Radagast and all the Balrogs, and they're basically a second tier angel underneath the nominal Archangels or Valar of the setting. And they are supposed to be very superhuman and portrayals again will vary, as would overall power and competence much as with humans. I said a moment ago that if we're talking about genuine transhumans or posthumans, or post-aliens as it were, that they are not impersonating gods any more than Superman and such folks are, and we should take a moment to explain that. If you have seen last week's Technological Singularity episode or any of our episodes on cyborgs, transhumans, posthumans, post-scarcity civilizations, Kardashev II civilizations, or smart matter, then you'll probably already have a good idea how big the power upgrade can be with one of these folks. They're not some modern human stepping out of a time machine to the days of yore with a STEM background and a backpack full of modern gadgets. Imagine a creature that can stand in the wilderness and hear a pin drop a mile away. Imagine a being who could stand in a packed football stadium and pick out any conversation going on, one that can see any frequency of light and probably has enough onboard scanners and processing power to see through walls or access any local Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Imagine they could not only pick out any conversation in that stadium, but could probably simultaneously hear and comprehend all of them. A good luck sneaking up on this person. Now they might be bulletproof, they might be able to dodge machine gun fire, they might not need superhuman speed or toughness due to their reflexes and predictive capabilities, They might be coordinated enough that when you went to shoot them, they kicked a piece of gravel right into your gun barrel, or right between your eyes. They probably still obey the known laws of physics so they're not doing Superman or Thor or Hulk style overpowered stuff, but they would flat out mortar any one of those gentlemen because they already know all the million little tricks to overcome superpowers, and to optimize the use of theirs in tandem. It's not just that they are more intelligent and inventive than a Reed Richards or Dr. Doom or Lex Luthor, it's that they could probably talk Doom or Luthor into giving up their evil, megamaniacal ways through sheer charm and psychology, and if that failed, by infecting them with nanobots that could brainwash them or restructure their brain. There's a common tendency for alien ambassadors to come to Earth in sci-fi and get a portrayal very akin to a messenger from God whereupon we often end up killing them, most notably in the classic film The Day the Earth Stood Still. This usually results in awesome retribution, and even that's pretty minimal compared to what a real interstellar civilization could do. Realistic aliens have warships that could sterilize our planet all by themselves, and potentially have trillions of them. And so killing their ambassador violates the first rule of warfare, never pick on anyone bigger than you are or ideally even the same size. But in the post-human context, shooting the alien ambassador isn't just a bad idea because his civilization will avenge him if they find out, rather it's because he's gonna raffle stomp you all by himself. Kill the alien ambassador by blowing his head clean off, and he might stand up a few seconds later to cheerfully inform you that such awesome regenerative technologies and medicines will be freely available to all as soon as our civilization joins their empire, which we should do right now. Or a copy of him might step off his ship looking irritable about what you did to his android avatar he'd been remote controlling, or his green alien blood might soak into the ground, infecting everything with nanobots that start spewing out war machines, nerve agents, and viruses that look like COVID and Ebola had a kid. All while also probably infecting your entire cyber and digital infrastructure and creating deepfakes so good your own folks are sending command codes to fire your ICBMs off at some place he tricked you into sending them. And remember, this guy's not special, he's just sporting the usual augmentation that everyone in his culture has, no more divine in their eyes than our smartphones make us in each other's. There was probably nobody acting as a waiter or flight steward on his ship, but if there were, that fellow would be similarly terrifying and unstoppable. Heck, the robot butler actually playing steward might come rolling out of the ship firing Gatling guns running on antimatter, so that every bullet out of the tube was a modest sized nuclear bomb. And all of this is just inside the zone of known physics, we're not even talking about critters who can bend or reverse time, ignore entropy, adjust physical constants, play with gravity or probability, 
or just fundamentally screw with the programming of reality itself. Godlike is fairly relative, and how awesomely powerful they would be is more of a limitation of our imagination than real physical constraints. To be honest, that earlier contemplation of the typical post-biological alien ambassador is my best fumbling guess at what the typical human is going to be like in a millennia or two, maybe sooner. And of course we don't really know what their powers would be, but in reality that's very secondary to what their motivations are. To the ant, it doesn't really matter if it's a mouse or a human, or an alien armada of super beings that want it dead, all that really matters is that all three can kill them easily and via many methods, and so all that really matters is what the motives of the godlike critter in question is. Now we can pair that up with asking about their ethics or maturity too, childlike super entities are popular concepts in fiction and mythology too, but the motivations question seems to mean more. For an alien focused on navel gazing to enlightenment, I'm not sure they have any motivation beyond personal survival. But while in fiction we sometimes see these sorts of folks quietly meditating and unwilling to take any action to defend themselves, preemptively or even when directly attacked, I'm not really clear on why this is viewed as enlightened, so I assume it does not apply universally. I don't think you've got vast ancient alien minds or empires that just ignore threats or ignore them to the last minute. There may be deeper purposes to existence, I like to think so, but the one programmed in by nature is survival and I can't see any life form casually discarding that as a major priority even if it becomes secondary to their other goals. So being smarter and more powerful should make them even better at survival and preparation. Now intelligence by itself doesn't necessarily mean its possessor is good at predicting problems and predisposed to do so, but generally in a complex and long-lived civilization, a capability to anticipate problems and willingness to delay self-gratification to manage them are valued traits that are encouraged. And it's hard to imagine a creature capable and determined to spend millennia or eons in isolated deep contemplations is not also of that sort of mindset. So if there is a big threat out there that they're not getting off their butts to handle, it's either because it's not a threat to them and they genuinely don't care if it's a threat to others, or because they already did handle it. It's not that that alien civilization thinks interfering with more primitive civilizations, even to save them from being wiped out is ethical, it's just that they don't care if we think they do, or they even prefer that we think that they won't help us, because they actually did help, they just didn't want us to know and thereby incorrectly assume that we will always have a big brother watching our back for us, as this might make us careless. We see something like this with the superhuman members of the Second Foundation in Isaac Asimov's classic Foundation trilogy. They all hidden but expose themselves to fix a major crisis, then have to work to restore initiative in those they rescued before faking their own obliteration. In cases like this, where a benevolent alien might help but pretend not to, we get to one of those predictive impasses, because if the super smart and powerful aliens are benevolent but don't want us to know they are, then they have the brains and capability to create the illusion plausibly. Same for if they're aiming for ambiguity. If a godlike entity wants you to go through life uncertain about their involvement and intent because they think that ambiguity is healthier for growth and free will than being certain they do or don't exist or act, then while that's going to require an impressive balancing act, you are probably talking about someone who finds juggling chainsaws while walking a tightrope in a hurricane a rather boringly simple effort. And that's one of the problems with godlike aliens. Even if they are acting like selfish morons, you do not know that you aren't responding to them exactly as they intended. It should be absurdly easy for them to convince you they are the nicest and best person you have ever met, even if they are absolutely selfish and diabolical. Indeed, even one of them apparently murdering and torturing someone in an apparent moment of sadistic and childish spite can't be ruled out, as it is probably in their capability to have, for some reason unknown to us, transfer that person's brain directly to a virtual paradise while puppeting their body to look and say convincingly tormented things, in order to achieve some desired effect in their audience. This is one of the problems when dealing with something like simulation hypothesis, when we ask if we might be living in a simulation because since we know it takes way less processing power to reasonably fake a human than to emulate one properly, 
We cannot look at the world around us and see other people suffering, especially folks we don't know intimately, and assume that the world cannot be a simulation because no one would make such a cruel virtual reality. Quite to the contrary, a civilization more advanced than ours, worrying about moral decay from all their advanced tech making life a little too easy, has a very good motivation to raise its kids in fake realities with hardship, what we usually call a nursery simulation, and that does not require that most apparent people in that simulation be fully sapient and sentient. So an individual can only judge the likelihood of themselves being a simulated universe where that judgment might hinge on ethical treatment of the folks inside it, based on their own personal experiences. It does not matter how many people you've heard about having awful lives or experiences far away, you don't know they are real, indeed even those people of your personal acquaintance might be fake. However, even your own personal experience is not enough to rule out such simulation, since advanced technology and techniques imply the ability to not only delete or dampen traumatic memories from someone once woken from the simulation, but also possess really good psychological counseling and capabilities. So they might not view you falling into the hands of a sadistic psychopath for a degrading and slow death to be unethical, because it's not irrevocable you will be awakened into a higher reality for a life far better and longer than the one you endured. Obviously that one sounds an awful lot like many a religion, and as often gets noted the difference between simulated realities, simulator realities, and programmers with higher and lower planes of existence, heavens and god or gods is pretty semantic, especially given that the entire idea the simulation is running on a computer relies on the notion that the lower simulated reality has the same physical laws and properties as the layer above. They might not have semiconductors to make computers like ours, indeed they might not even have the same math. And when we were talking earlier about what a post-human or alien might be like, we were still working at the fairly low scale, we weren't talking about something like a Matrioska brain. If you're not familiar with the Matrioska brain, the name has to do with it being a multi-layered spherical construct, but the short form is, it's a mega computer running on the entire power output of a star, the power output is about a trillion trillion times more than what your typical high-end gaming PC draws when it's running heavy and hot. So the assumption is that even if we never improved our computer chips or solar panels beyond what they are right now, you can have something pretty terrifyingly potent if you're willing to convert a whole star to that purpose. Given that there's hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy that seem not to be doing much of anything with the majority of their power output, the assumption is that any alien species that could travel to our star could also have traveled to others and built these. Truth be told, building nothing but computer chips and solar panels is not something we would think of as a very hard job for some self-replicating robots. They are already the ones building our current chips and panels, and thus probably requiring less brains and processing power than your phone or PC or tablet has. And mind you, that trillion trillion figure is assuming their computers are no better than ours, which seems improbable. What's more, the human brain runs on similar power levels in between what modern PCs and smartphones do, and while we might not have true AI yet, I think the loose consensus of researchers in that field is that our current best supercomputers, which run on under a megawatt, are probably already sufficient to run something human-level intelligence once the software catches up, so to speak. Nobody is really thinking we need a thousand times the power or processing to get that job done anymore. This episode isn't about super-intelligent AI, but it is about the idea of entities which would either match that, exceed that, or could build and control that, and keeping in mind that even a computer that needed a full megawatt to mimic a human intellect would still leave enough sunlight for 40 billion billion siblings, or 40 billion versions of itself a billion times smarter than a person. We're not really talking about some singular entity that's godlike, but more an entire species, and one that probably outnumbers us. So yes, simulating an entire universe is well within the capability of something like a Matrioska brain, and in that sort of case, all that can matter is motivation because capability is simply irrelevant. If we're encountering one who shares our universe with us, then it holds every single card except those being held by fellow or rival minds of similar scope. It's not right to think of it as regarding us as we regard an ant or even an amoeba, because it is not us, 
It has enough brain power to simultaneously carry on a meaningful conversation with every human who ever lived simultaneously and still be using only the tiniest fraction of its mind for that. We are not distracting it from some weird quest to calculate every digit of pi, or something like that, by asking it a couple of questions. Indeed it wouldn't be distracted even by scanning our brains, making copies of them, running a billion simulated realities trying out different results of possible answers, and a millisecond later giving an answer well designed to get us to do whatever it wants, which might be to go away and not bother it till we're building our own matrioska brain to help in the sacred task of calculating pi. But what would help even more would have been to cannibalize the whole galaxy into computers for calculating that, not just one star. And that clearly isn't being done to our galaxy, so either one doesn't exist yet or doesn't find those kind of tasks interesting or enlightening, and maybe would find us more interesting than some folks assume. Personally I find humans much more interesting than pie, mathematical or flavorful. If we are in its simulation though, it has utter control of its reality if it's simulating it and you are inside it, and that includes being able to erase your memories or rewrite them or predict your actions or even build in flags and alerts for if you start getting suspicious of how real things are or are not. You don't notice glitches in the matrix and when you do, it gets a notification and suddenly you think it's irrelevant or forgot. You don't believe you're not real and it can ensure you don't. Assuming the term real matters in this context, as I often say in regard to the simulation hypothesis and the question of if we live in a simulation or not, the better question is probably to ask if it actually matters. We can hypothesize advanced civilizations built on morality and personal discipline, slowly degrading to petulant spoiled children, though still possess godlike powers. But we cannot casually overlook that they should have a lot of resources for preventing that, like advanced psychology and simulated nurseries and so on. They are likely to be functionally immortal too, so the wise and composed founders of the enlightened civilization didn't go anywhere, dying to be replaced by increasingly degenerate descendants, each just a little more degraded than the last. They are still there, and what's more, spoiled kids are not an inevitability of a civilization. A quick and incomplete list of signs a child is spoiled include that they don't express gratitude, they hate being told no, they don't play well with peers or share, nor volunteer to help, they throw tantrums and lash out, do not compromise or show empathy, nor care if they inconvenience others, and are often bullies, manipulative, and demand special treatment. When you contemplate that list, it reminds me a lot of many of the fears expressed about interacting with a given powerful alien, so on the one hand it seems a very legitimate worry. Problem is that it is ignoring that their improvements in technology probably also apply to psychology and child development, and such behaviors are at least as detrimental to their own civilization as foreign ones. I'm not sure I go so far as to say that civilizations have a predisposition to eliminate antisocial behavior, but it is probably fair to say that societies tend to want to seek to curb antisocial behavior, and thus we wrap around again to the concept of motivation, what the alien actually wants, because realistically we won't be able to tell much simply by its behavior. Now that alien might just want to be entertained, But unless we are assuming actual and total access to infinite resources, it probably does not bother fully simulating an entire civilization of actual sapient minds, and yet it should seek virtual reality as an alternative to being entertained by actual living creatures in its own universe where that would be difficult or risk angering other parties who could act against it. It is presumably smart enough to know how much extra risk and effort is being expended to little gain, and it's also presumably smart enough to notice signs of pathological or addictive behavior in itself. It may come from a civilization where that's as easily and quickly treatable as a minor cut, and it may come from a civilization that gives people something akin to an immune system for their minds. As with many fundamental behaviors we might describe to a godlike alien that we wouldn't like, we can ask ourselves why we think it is bad, and odds are the critter in question or their civilization are aware why it might be objectionable assuming they don't agree. We would not suggest someone create an entire virtual reality full of actual thinking and feeling creatures just for their entertainment, or curiosity or lab experiment either. 
We would also not suggest they travel to islands or wards inhabited by primitive peoples to play at God and satisfy their urges for entertainment or curiosity without restriction. Emphasis on without restriction, because I don't think we're saying it's immoral to be entertained or curious, just that you would do these without restraint, and if you do have peers, you don't want them thinking you would either, because they are in a position to restrain you and now you've given them a motive to consider doing so. What other motives are there that would fit what we see? Well as we discussed some years back in our episode Gods and Monsters, we cannot rule out that we really do live in a universe created by various inhuman, insane, predatory, and or sadistic godlike entities against which we are utterly helpless and which would drive us mad merely to look upon. We discussed why that would seem counterindicated by the apparent universe we live in, but this does not mean we can just assume a godlike alien has motivations like ours. We are not going through them all because not only are there plenty of examples, but it's also rather one-dimensional to assume such an entity has one principal motivation that is all it cares about, which we often see with AI computer minds in sci-fi too. That's another common habit in fiction, to portray godlike entities as somehow more simplistic than us too. Which is possible but to me usually just indicates bad writing. We cannot examine all the various combinations of how powerful aliens would act with human motives, let alone alien versions of those. Nonetheless, we can assume that these will tend to be pursued effectively, because whatever their goals are, they presumably want to achieve most of those successfully or for the least effort and that implies a use of logic and familiarity and skill with contemplating scenarios and outcomes and alternatives. So when we go on and propose a scenario like, these aliens don't interfere with us because they think it's wrong, we can ask why they think it is, for instance if they think specifically that they would be hurting us by doing so, and with that motive in mind, that they do not want to hurt us, we can then review their presumed capabilities and ask what alternatives they have. One alternative would be hiding from us while carefully sneaking us in technologies and knowledge that minimized our problems, as they saw them, as quickly as they thought safe. That's essentially what we try to do in these discussions of hypothetical and unseen aliens, figure out goals and motives from the apparent universe around us, and then ask how they might better pursue that goal and if the universe we seem to see would still apply. If they view us as primitives wrecking our ecology, rather than hiding only to show up when a lot of damage is already done with a stern lecture, they could just show up, explain what could have happened, and offer us technological alternatives like clean fusion. If that's their motive, preserving natural ecologies as they emerge in our universe, that method would seem better. And there are important contemplations too because we have to remember while fiction likes to have us meet folks who are on our level or maybe a few millennia ahead or behind, all of human civilization amounts to only a few millions of the time that life has existed on this planet or in this galaxy. And transhuman and posthuman existences seem a lot sooner on the horizon than us learning to make fire and chat around it is behind us. So almost every new encounter we have with an alien mind should either be one so primitive it's not even at the chimp or dolphin stage, or so advanced it could be considered godlike. The upside we have is that for the latter case, the responsibility of that first contact situation really isn't on us. The older, smarter, stronger, and hopefully wiser alien civilization presumably has the ability and common sense to have done their prep work on learning our language and customs and minimizing the chance for misunderstandings. If one walks down a ramp from its ship threateningly while waving a gun and gets shot by some nervous soldier or police officer and their companion starts going on about how violent we are and how foolish to assume harm was meant, I think we have a right to turn around and ask how they could possibly not have realized that would provoke us. Of course the problem with a godlike alien is, they might not care if we pointed that out and just opt to crush us and maybe more enthusiastically for having gotten uppity and pointed out their bad logic. It's a thing to keep in mind as we head to the stars, as they do seem empty of ancient and godlike civilizations thus far, that we might be the first one on the scene and might be the ones walking down the ramp from our spaceship to say we come in peace and want to speak with their leader, and hopefully we, or our scouts and vanguards, will act with ethics and consequences in mind. We will examine the alternate side of all this, primitive aliens rather than godlike ones, later this summer.
I often get asked by folks who want to share knowledge on some topic for advice on getting started on YouTube or podcasting, or if to do it, and someone asked me recently what I liked the most about using video as a format for discussing topics and material. I said I liked that it let me prepare a topic in a well scripted way, then use a mix of visuals and audio to enhance that presentation over people just reading a blog or listening to my voice only. The follow up was what do you most miss having that video does not permit, and I said I missed the hands-on interactivity and back and forth with students I got when teaching labs back in college, or when I was instructing or tutoring on this or that in the army where I often instructed on use of weapons and other equipment, and various topics. Nothing ever beats interactive learning, it is simply the best way to learn, and that's something our longtime show sponsor Brilliant understands all too well. I remember years back when I first saw their courses on math, science, and computer science, being impressed and wishing I had them as a student, and in those years of working with them as a show sponsor, I've been equally impressed at how they focused on production and constant improvement of visually stimulating, fun, challenging, hands-on, and interactive content. For instance, Brilliant's new Everyday Math course takes you through foundational subjects with their trademark interactivity. A lot of people have struggled with fractions, but when you approach them in a visual way, they make a lot more sense. With Brilliant, you can learn at your own pace, learn on the go, and learn something new. To get started for free, visit Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur or click on the link in the description, and the first 200 people will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So we're into May now and we have a lot of episodes ahead. As a reminder, this month's livestream Q&A will instead be held at the International Space Development Conference, and we'll broadcast my talk there though at our usual time, Sunday, May 29th at 4pm Eastern, and I hope you can join us then, on the live stream or in person in Arlington, Virginia. I will also be a keynote speaker at this year's Biocene at the Ohio Aerospace Institute in Cleveland, May 18th through 20th and I will be talking Friday morning, May 20th. I'll leave a link to register in person or virtually for both events in our episode description. Before then we've got some episodes and next week we'll ask about how we might keep an atmosphere on Mars by making a magnetosphere for Mars. After that we'll have our Sci-Fi Sunday episode, Lost Space Colonies, and what would happen on them. Then we'll be launching into a new mini-series looking at finding and exploring distant worlds, surveying for habitable interstellar star systems on Thursday, May 19th. Then we'll close out the month with a look at dark sky stations, stratospheric satellites, and ultra-low orbital infrastructure. Now if you want to alert when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell, and if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and share it with others and leave a comment below. You can also join the conversation on any of our social media forums, find our audio-only versions of the show, or donate to help support future episodes. And all of those options and more are listed in the links in the episode description. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week. Thank you.